Hi, this is Patrick Kilpatrick, and guess what? I'm on So Booking Cool with Jewel B, and I'm talking about my book, Dying for Living, Sins and Confessions of a Hollywood Villain and Libertine Patriot. Keep reading. I'll talk to you soon. Welcome to So Booking Cool. It's Jewel B. This one is from The Vault. This is a long overdue part two. So earlier this year in 2019, I had the pleasure of speaking with action villain star and writer Patrick Kilpatrick about his book, Sins and Confessions of a Hollywood Villain and Libertine Patriot, Dying for Living, Volume 1, Upbringing. So Patrick Kilpatrick has a breadth of wisdom on film, television, Hollywood, as well as journalism. And he's worked alongside the likes of Bruce Willis, Tom Cruise, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Sean Young fat just to name a few. It was a great chat with Patrick, and I really wanted to make sure that I got part two up before we head into 2020, which, by the way, if you did not get to listen to part one, you definitely will have to like check part one out. So in part two, Patrick Kilpatrick discusses the books that entertained him and drove him emotionally. He also talks about whether he thinks actors should do their own stunts, how he studies the character, the struggle of shaking off an intense character, and the biggest misconception that the masses have about Hollywood. He also reveals what he always tells and teaches his acting students. So all of this and more in part two of my conversation with the awesome Patrick Kilpatrick, only on So Booking Cool. What are the books that kept you entertained, made you laugh, drove you emotionally? Um, the first thing that comes to mind is Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. I mean, I read that first in when it was published in Rolling Stone in 1972. And if ever I was blue, all I had to do was read that book and it cracked me up. And it perfectly encapsulated it, the time and the place. And, and I've come to realize that it's hyperfiction more than gonzo journalism. It's gonzo journalism, but gonzo journalism in itself is hyperfiction. And, uh, and, and then actually, Hunter Thompson was a far better novelist than he was given credit for. So that's certainly a book that anything by Tom Wolfe is tremendously entertaining. You know, everything from Bonfire of the Vanities to the right stuff to Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. Norman Mailer had tremendously entertainment and entertaining books. Uh, Thomas McGuane's a wonderful American writer. His uh, novels are incredibly entertaining. Um, I'm pretty much a history buff beyond that, but um, the people who embodied new journalism, I find, are great. There, there's a guy, I don't know his name, but it's a wonderful book called Empire of the Summer Moon. Mm. Uh, that is uh, about the meeting of the Comanches and the Europeans in Texas, and it's so brilliantly written by a, a journalist for the Austin newspaper. I, can't, I don't know his name offhand, but a brilliant book. Um, uh, a lot of great books out there. There's some good things. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm reading uh, Cry Freedom right now, which is the history of the Civil War, uh, such a pivotal time. I know a great deal about the Civil War, but, you know, this one won the Pulitzer Prize, so I wanted to give that a read. You know, what are some of the most interesting aspects, would you say, about your career in film and television that most people just wouldn't get to see? Well, I don't know that uh, they really get how much hard work it is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the audition process is incredibly competitive and only more so now that you have digital submissions. I mean, they're getting 3,000, 4,000 submissions per job now. And so the competitiveness that, of that, the mastery of that that has to be required in order to succeed and to continue and, and flourish as a working actor is probably, you know, a lot of people, I think, they just say, oh, you just stand up and you say your lines in front of the camera. There's some of that, but those people don't really, really flourish. 
Um, it, it, Hollywood it, it involves immense work, uh, writing work, production work, um, audition work, uh, crafting a character work. Um, I think also um, they'd be surprised by the lack of discipline by some leading names. I, I'm on my fifth movie where the leading man couldn't learn his own lines. Wow. Uh, either because of wretched excess throughout their life or self-indulgence, uh, which is sad and tragic. Uh, it becomes a monumental editing uh, challenge to get a performance out of them. Wow. Um, so uh, I just think sometimes, and, and, and really I, I – the the crazies make it really interesting and funny, but the the behavior of some people is just pretty uh, out to lunch, and uh, they don't give me a hard time because I think they look at me and think, oh, he'll kill me, but um, uh, they they tend to be pretty self involved and pretty narcissistic. Not everybody. I mean, I can't say a bad thing about Tom Cruise. Everybody always wants to know, yeah, what's Tom Cruise like? I mean, you know, Arnold, they're just super hardworking guys. I, I don't get Scientology, but um, Tom, I, I can't say anything bad about him. You know, he's really dedicated to getting a dynamic product out. He does his own stunts. He risks his own life. He's uh, a really polite, uh, nice person generous human being so um, same thing with Arnold really a lot of fun to work with Arnold Schwarzenegger so that, the most gracious person I've ever met in my life and uh, he doesn't like guns which is really interesting who, you know, who? because his whole career is based on the killer and uh, hard boiled but probably the greatest action movies ever put together I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't have like great sound just then. Who did you say after Arnold? Chow Yun Fat. Oh, um, okay. At one time, okay. arguably the greatest, you know, the biggest movie star in the world, because he was from China. He's the most gracious of human beings and doesn't like guns, uh, and which is really ironic considering his whole career was founded on two movies, Hard Boiled and and uh, The Killer. Um, which are the greatest action gun movies you've ever seen in your life. Um, everybody's got their unique, you know, as a, uh, I imagine you are, you're, you're a keen observer of human beings. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if it's Bruce Willis or Naomi Watts or Pam Greer or Lou Gossett Jr. or, um, Meg Ryan or Mark Harmon or all the people that I've worked with, they all have their individuality and they, and uh, that's particularly interesting to me. And it's something I wanted to convey uh, in the book. Now, what can you tell us about some of your, your new projects such as Nightwalk, Active Shooter and Catalyst? Well, Nightwalk is done um, and about to be released um, it's a, um, I call it a Romeo and Juliet story, a Western journalist that, played by Sean Stone, Oliver's son, uh, falls in love with an Islam beauty. Uh, it ends tragically and he's thrown into prison. And I am a sort of towering vessel of hate who runs the prison. And I can tell you that I improv my entire way through the entire movie and uh, it's coming out. It's actually being premiered at the Moscow International Film Festival, I think, because one of the producers who was uh, Russian, Tatiana. But uh, it'll have a, uh, an American premiere soon enough. And then Catalyst, really interesting project. Um, I played a pedophile priest in that one. Yeah. And... Uh, it was Chris Vulcans is a terrific filmmaker, young filmmaker. He actually created an environment, very um, strict environment. But once you were in that environment, the strict environment, you improv the entire movie. So uh, I like improving, and I, I think I'm good at it, as was everybody else he cast. And so 
I hope that's going to be an interesting movie. It's about seven guys, each representing the seven deadly sins, and we wake up and we're confined in a room together, and we have to figure out how to save the world uh, from our own sins. And um, very interesting studying uh, pedophilia, uh, certainly an activity that is more reviled than almost any other activity on the planet. But uh, what I found was that the motivations and the genesis of pedophilia is very close to a lot of other uh, human flaws, like uh, overeating or drugs or promiscuity. Uh, uncomfortably close, the origins of it are very, very similar. You know, these things come out of emotional loss, uh, loneliness. Uh. Now, there's there are people who are just pure evil, and they just go over the edge. Mm -hmm. But um, I, uh, you know, and we all have to exist in personal accountability. Uh, none of that is to remove the accountability uh, of people who commit such acts. Um, but it is interesting if one studies it that the origins of it are very, very similar to a lot of other human flaws. Okay, what about when you hear, because some people say that people do certain, people perform certain behaviors that was done to them. Would you agree with that as well? I would think, yeah, a huge um, percentage. You're talking about 85, 90% of all rapists were sexually abused when they were younger. Uh, um, domestic abusers were almost universally abused themselves when they were growing up. Um, <clears throat> you know, these things extend to full-scale countries. Um, if you look at World War II and the cultures that emerged from Germany and Japan, they were cultures that were particularly brutal. And uh, so they visited brutality on other uh, speak other nationalities. Um, so brutality and violence often begets brutality and violence. Sexual abuse begets sexual abuse. These things are generational and just keeps going. Again, none of that uh, removes a person's individual accountability from the time that they're about 19, 20, 21 years old. But they, they, they're they going to have a journey to come out of that, uh, and hopefully they get the help that they need or the guidance they need, and they don't. Uh, we all have this choice to be either be an angel or a devil every moment of every day. Uh, I suspect a lot of people might choose to be devils if they thought they'd get away with it. You mentioned studying for the role. I, w I would love to know, what are some of your favorite ways to study a character? Well, they're very, very different, um, uh, but usually it involves reading all the literature about it. Um, there's a lot of literature on the Internet and books on pedophilia. If I'm playing a Vietnam uh, major, uh, then I read all the books that have to do with that. And then uh, the doing of it, the performing of it, is not the same as that research. But that research enthuses what you're doing. It, it layers it and colors it and it adds authenticity to it. You still have to live moment to moment uh, and be hyper-creative, which is sometimes opposite from how you would think something might happen. I call it paradox, average, uh, paradox uh, acting. You do the opposite. Uh, you'd think you would cry, but you smile. But you have to live moment to moment with that research in you. Mm. Some of it has to do with wardrobe, um, dialects. I do have done a lot of dialects, and I certainly love wardrobe. So what a character wears is really, really important. Um, every Everything is about elevating that character within the movie and at the same time telling the story of the script. Yes. 
yeah, and you said that you do have to let that kind of sit with you for a minute. Can it take a while for an actor to stop being that character that they played that they were so committed to becoming? I think that's more of a reliability when you're very young mm -hmm. or you're just starting out. Um, I think yeah, you're the, a pro, so yeah, you're you're yeah. The the more you keep doing it, the more you can click in and out of that. Okay. Um, so uh, um, yeah, it's a function of I don't know, just professionalism, but you just that it become it doesn't become necessary to keep take that rapist home, you know, uh, with that kind of a thing. So, um, and also it's acting. It's it's not you. It is you in the sense that it's you're you're the vessel that's carrying out this character. But it's not you. Uh, I'm not a serial killer, and I'm not a rapist. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in fact, I think I'm a very good father and a good boyfriend and a fiance. And so, uh, haven't always been, but um, you know, I just. And able to manifest those people, right? Yeah, I want. I wanted to also ask a pro because I, I know like the the actor Michael B. Jordan after he played Killmonger, he said it took a long time for him to get that character out of his system, and it was like he said it like it had a negative impact. But yeah, hmm. well, I've tried to diminish all of that. I think for me, it's more of a case of you're exhausted and you need mm. to take some time to perhaps be alone uh, so that you're not visiting that exhaustion on your family um, or your colleagues or friends. I mean, you take a guy like Heath Ledger, mm -hmm. I'm sure if he had gone to a Caribbean vacation for a month instead of stepping right into another movie, he might have survived. But and, and the other thing you have to be very conscious of is, you better have good habits on a daily basis because the rigors of that kind of transformational acting are considerable. And so you're going to need some downtime out of it. And if you're a drinker or you smoke pot all the time and you eat fatty foods and you don't take care of yourself and you don't have any physicality, it's going to be harder to come out of that period of exhaustion. You know, these things like drinking and drugs and stuff, they often can put you into what I call the lower quadrant. And uh, so it's no surprise that uh, an artist like Jackson Pollock, you know, who drank all the time, had violent arguments with his wife in car accidents um, because he was operating from the lower quadrant. I'm sure he would have been a great painter if he didn't have those negative habits. Unfortunately, some people get into that stuff. I've always had athleticism and uh, that kind of thing to sort of bolster me, to help me through those difficult times. And, you know, massage and chiropractic and the things you need to do to restore yourself just for daily living, not just merely for acting. Mm. Right. What what would you say were some of those difficult times, if you could say? Well, <clears throat> you don't have to say you difficult. Don't. No difficult times. Oh, I mean, you could, you've got difficult times like divorce. You've got difficult times, uh, challenging times when you're a dad or a father or a mother. Um, you've got challenging times when you're you're working so much that you're literally. I can't tell you how many times I've fallen asleep in the garage. I just had enough to get home and turn the car off, and then you pass out because the time pressures of television and the time pressures of film are such that you're spending 18, 14 hours, 18, 14 hours a day working, uh, driving to and from the set, and if you've got any kind of specialized makeup, you're in the chair earlier and after, uh, more so than uh, otherwise. So, you know, it's it's a demanding physical uh, journey, and if you're doing your own stunts and your own fights, you've got bumps and bruises and 
uh, bursitis of the elbow and injuries and knee uh, tears and all kinds of other stuff that you <clears throat> I'm very very grateful for a car accident I had when I was 17 because on the surface it seemed like a really bad thing but uh, I couldn't play sports anymore but because of it I got into healing modalities of exercise massage chiropractic uh, very balanced exercises. So, and I also became a writer. So those are great things to have when I found myself becoming an actor. You have the mind of a writer, but you've got the body of an athlete again, but you can also resurrect yourself from the intense physical and emotional demands of, of the acting. Um, I know what I'm like when I'm centered. So if I get too far off, I know what I have to do in order to find it. I don't find it in the bottom of a bottle, you know, or with a drug. That's not what's going to work for you uh, long term. Mm -hmm. I also have to know your thoughts on stunts. Do you think that actors should do their own stunts or at least try to? Well, I think that's a personal choice. I mean, like Anthony Hopkins won't lift a teep cup uh, on his own, which is okay. That's how Anthony Hopkins works. But I was six foot two, and I had athlete sensibility, and um, uh, uh, I, I, I think a lot of times you can get a much better shot if the actor is uh, if the actor is doing it because an actor is always going to put the emotional component behind the action and that will enthuse the shot a good stunt man has to learn how to they do things by the numbers so they're going to have to learn to put that emotional context into the shot I think they're very, very good at using stunt doubles and everything now, but in a lot of lower budget movies, sometimes you don't even have a stunt double and you want to do those things. The other thing is doing your own stunts um, is exhilarating. I mean, Tom Cruise isn't doing it just because he's doing it because he gets off on it. You know, it, it makes him feel alive. He's living out on the edge. It's like driving a motorcycle. Um, motorcycling is inherently dangerous, but you do it because of the sense of exhilaration that it gives you. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I did a bunch of the stuff that I did. You know, you, you're doing something that maybe you've never done before, you know, jumping through an exploding glass window with two guns blazing. I've never done that before, but I did it because I felt confident in my physical activity. Uh, acumen and and uh, I wanted to give it a try and you're living you're very intensely living when you're doing something like that or when you're stunt driving precision driving um, uh, all of that's great I mean it, it, that's exactly why Steve McQueen did all of his own stuff I'm sure including motorcycle crashes because he got off on it he's living high and wild and, let, and let's suppose you got a lot of money You've got more money than God. Some of these guys have had. What's what are they going to do to turn themselves on? You know, they they've got to put themselves. Uh, you know, a, a certain element of risk is a really good thing. You don't want to get caught. You don't want to get killed. But you was triumphing over risk is a is a is a great feeling. And is it a process, would you say, doing stunts in terms of, like, when you feel like you get good at it? Well, I was always physical. I mean, I, did, I played football, basketball, baseball, swimming, horseback riding, horse jumping, fencing, you know, cutlass fighting, uh, jujitsu, boxing. I've done all of those things. So uh, I call it movie black belt. You work out yeah. the dance. You you work out the dance, and it is like a dance because you have to do it very quickly and fast. And um, you know, when I first started out, maybe I'd do a movie with Jean Claude Van Damme, and we'd spend two weeks on the fights. I ended up doing movies with Billy Blanks, the eight-time world karate champion, and we 
do them all the fights in one afternoon. So, yeah, you get really good at it, and you get really fast, and you get much better at remembering the steps of the dance. Uh, I've been very lucky because I kind of had a photographic memory, so the, the normal challenges of, of memorization and, and learning those steps was not difficult for me. I could do it. Um, and, of course, it's not without calculation because I pad up, you know, I had my own skateboard pads I use. Sometimes you make wardrobe decisions based on what what can I put those elbow pads underneath, you know, um, because there's an old adage, you're going to hit whatever place you don't put a pad on. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, uh, you pad up. I'm not interested in getting hurt. I'm not interested in getting killed. I'm interested in being as free as I possibly can within that shot and getting the best shot I possibly can. You never get paid for it as an actor, though. You know, you don't get any extra money for doing it. What if the actor gets injured badly? Like, does the studio pay for, like, the medical bills or anything? Yeah, of course, with the insurance, and also we have Screen Actors Guild Medical, which is a very good medical program, but... uh, that's not what you want, and that's not what the production wants. They don't want somebody getting hurt. And mm-hmm. so uh, that's why they sometimes stop you from doing some of the things. Oh. Um, you know, because their production, it's going to cost them a lot of money if the lead actor is hurt and down. Um, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars per day. So, no, they'll, I mean, they'll ask, they'll say, hey, do you want to do this? And I'll go, yeah, sure, I'll do that. Um, but you do everything you can to keep from getting hurt. I I just have, like, two two more questions. There's so much to ask you, Mr. Patrick. <laughs> but I know I can't keep you. What is the What is the wildest story, or rather the biggest misconception, do you think the masses have about Hollywood? I think um, I'm going to say something that's that's unfortunate, uh, but I call Hollywood the culture of theft. I think uh, maybe people out there in the hinterland or the reading public or other walks of life don't really realize how much people have to protect their intellectual property here because uh, if certain aspects of the whole system operate on stealing other people's intellectual ideas and not honoring that. I think that's uh, one of the more insidious things about Hollywood. Um, and you have to know how to relate to those institutions, whether it's the studios, the major agencies, the major production companies, in such a way that you're not going to get taken to the cleaners. But if you go willy nilly right into it, they'll just take you to the take you to the cleaners. By the way, something I really like also that you mentioned in the book is that you, someone like you, like super accomplished and everything, a veteran in your career, you you got there without like a, a big time agency or P- PR person, right? No, I um, I've used PR twice in my life. Once when I did. The movie replaced McKillers. Uh, it was the same PR person I'm using now. And once for this book, I was always going to do a PR campaign for the book. Um, um, no, I was too busy raising my family and, and getting my kids to really good schools and stuff like that to spend uh, money on PR people. Um, but um, I, I had good agents. Um Doing the theater company in New York, um, it was, is a wonderful way to get in because you're always working, you're always doing a play, and you can send out notices to agents and they won't come the first time, they won't come the second time, but maybe the third time they'll come down and see you play. And then they'll give you a couple of auditions to see how you'll do. And you book that work and pretty soon you're their client. Um, I, I did a play in uh, Second Stage in New York, which is a very prestigious theater. And as soon as I did that, everybody in the theater world and the New York entertainment world and film 
uh, television goes to the second stage. They see the work there. So if you work in that environment, you're going to get agents and managers. And ever since then, uh, I've gone with that. And I've had, I've had good agents, um, APA, and um, I've been with a, an outfit called Activity for a long, long time. And um, they get you appointments. But you also have to do your own crafting. And, like, I get offered work from people who've worked with me before. I'm following up on pro- projects uh, and that kind of thing. So there's 50% comes from an agent. 50% comes from uh, your own endeavors. And I'm also a big believer that actors need to be creating their own content, writing something. I mean, this book is – it is a PR exercise in some ways. It's also – my own content so you, mm-hmm. you have to be you have to have your own creative life not only for your advancement of your career but for your own sanctity of of psychology and well-being and your own economic uh, sanctuary you know, I, I teach a lot of young actors uh, in a mentorship yes. pro- program that we have. And I always teach them no writing, no acting, no directing, and create your own content. Uh, an actor, a director, a producer, um, a writer, they need to have stuff that they're doing other than just put their hand out for a job from someplace else. Um, preferably something that's complementary, like script writing for an actor or um, that kind of thing, which, by the way, I, I'm a judge for the UCLA uh, uh, script writing competition. So I've got three scripts I got to read tonight. Oh, um, okay. So, okay. Well, but, but I, I, I want to tell your audience Amazon.com for the book, or uh, uh, both Audible and paperback, hardcover, and Kindle, and then Barnes and Noble same. Uh, if they want an autograph copy, they can go to my website, patrickkilpatrick.com, if they can't get to one of our signings. And uh, I hope they'll write a review, too. I'd love to hear from them. Yes. Patrick Kilpatrick, everyone. Thank you again for taking the time. It was a pleasure, and I would love to talk to you again in the future. Thank you. Well, I'll see you for Volume 2, and I uh, yes. thank you for doing what you do. And I love your title. So I look forward to seeing the work onward and upward. Yes, like likewise. And thank you so much to all the listeners. Until next time, so booking cool.